Asiya Wadud, and I'm one of the curators with Belladonna, and Anna Paula is the other curator. And um, we have been working on putting together a season's worth of readings. And um, tonight's reading culminates our season. And we are so happy to welcome you all here tonight to, uh, to listen to Iman Marcel and Aditi Machado, and followed by a, a moderated conversation with Omar Barada. So um, Belladonna is um, an organization that puts together readings like, like this one. And also, um, we have these little ephemeral chaplets, which we have tonight to commemorate our readings. Um, they will be for sale in the back, along with a few other books. And DT's full-length book that came out last year is also available for sale. Um, we, have, uh, we have this touch, and then we have the Displaced Voice. It's English Arabic, and then English for DT. Um, and together, they are eight dollars alone or five each. And so the order of events tonight is we'll have a DT read first, and then Iman, and then we'll have a conversation moderated by four. So without further ado, I will introduce our readers. The dazzling assemblage of landscapes in the DT Machado's work could be one in which the throat is a corset, the bowl is full of spice, a vase is emptied, the proclamations are at once firm, though a stranger and strange and slippery in this. Or the landscape slopes syllabically, a wind a text, a wind a text, the wind touches to the skin textile. What worlds do we have here? The world in which the flowers are general and particular and ancient. Aditi Machado is a poet, translator, and editor. She is the author of the books on beheadings from Night Boat last year and two chapbooks, Root. Bride, and the Roving of the Bride. The translation of Paratalu's Prosopopeia was published by Action in 2016. Recent work can be found in Poor Claudia, Folder Magazine, Witness, Chicago Review, among others. Aditi edits poetry and translation for Asymptote and is, writer, is writing her dissertation at the University of Denver. It's my pleasure to welcome you to you. I think I will read um, a little bit from my two 
uh, published uh, books. Um, and then some new work, including the beautiful chaplet that Belladonna made. Um, so I'll start with um, some beheadings. So this is my book of poems that came out last year. Root Desert. A wind blows. The desert unfolds. To sleep on its pillow is succulent as cacti swelling in times of plenty, shrinking in drought. When I lived in the desert, I was so young and spiny, drinking rain into my lungs. Now it is culture everywhere and speculum. The desert melts, the sky's glass. I muse on this as on myriad crystalline forms. The cactus flower prescribes water. Its bouquet walks along the coast of an absent sea. Sand divines my desiccation. So too with culture, words I use to speak my distance from the desert. Culture too resides in me, an intercourse most internal. Sand flares. I parse the granular, the heat values. Opening its sepals, rain palsies. A navel in the sand, elements and oasis. In the steely night, lying on my belly. In the steely night, lying on my back. On the sand, half sunk, a shattered. A neck spills its faint lesson. The hourglass fills with lust. What is heard, what is not heard, congregate on the sleeves of weather rotating the windows. Material survives, soaked and running, formic on the rocks, Ophelia in the pool. The listening I was summoned to perform, I perform it. In heat, my eye fears what seduces my ear. Voices stem lush, sink like petrol. Laborious, ambulatory desires turn the desert. Here is a romance pointing, here, here. In heat, my tongue delivers a sermon like a caress. In heat, your tongue delivers a tongue, a sermon like a caress. In the heart of the desert, a decadence. My arrival, its catalysis. Labial, dunes, Rooms. Inside looking, like outside looking, sways. Sand in a gray photograph pointillates. Gray soils approbate gray singing. The pure bird of no negation arrives. Feelings drive an arm toward fruit. Things to say then happen in a spasm. Things meaning soil and finger shape a line. A surface tense a circle in passions. A cactus circumscribes water. I touched someone in that desert as time won't. This one's called Blessed Is. A day, avid century. A time when, when bestowed locus. I look about the place as it dislocates for the venereal heart. Here is a symposium and time is ludic. I feel I am happening in a sleeve. Locusts are swarming. Lust is. Here is a valence. We were paragraphing the sun. My friends and I, unhappy with anything pitched higher than darkness, discouraged beatitudes. What is more dangerous, perfection in the body or a perfection in the mind? I saw the seashell everywhere making a unit of life, the unsprung sound of a thing unseen. There is a place in my heart. There is a heart. There is my academy hinging the preposition. I configured myself one day by not entering the pool. No contentment overflowed. To fill my life as an index, 
to feel crying is by onion. There is an astringent for everything. It is lexical. Blessed is the heart. Blessed is my Gethsemane of florid logic. I am lucid in the afternoon. Graceful living, benevolence, pure bond. Um, so, um, I'll read just a small paragraph from this book called Presopopoeia by a French writer of Moroccan origin named Ferry Tully. And um, this is, I guess you would call it a novella with some poetic elements in it. And it's a book about, um, in, in which the narrator is sort of grieving for the death of his older brother uh, who suffered from drug addiction and uh, died from AIDS-related complications. And I picked this little paragraph because uh, it mentions Arabic and the sound of Arabic. Forty days would have passed between the first ceremony and the last. There was a time, a dead time, that followed the death of the body, which was calm, having been abandoned by pain, and now engulfed by two long songs which got mixed up. It was neither a period nor a duration, just a time sensed too early and known too late. It's to keep company with the deceased, someone said, so that he knows where he's going, that he won't be there alone. His room had been emptied of all furniture. It was also the room in which I slept. I was crouched in a corner, Old Arab men with receptive palms were sitting in an almost perfect circle in which each one in his place rhymed with another. And those soft, rhyming words, whose meaning I could not understand, seemed to be coming out of their palms. I knew they were from the Quran, that it was music. I recognized its rhythm. I breathed in the syllables. They cured tuberculosis. I hung on to each successive rhyme, each time it was the same. I puffed out my chest at the beginning of every verse. It was like nectar for my lungs. The words came loose as though liquid, and flowing in a single gush, came to rest on my lips as at the source of a garden as old as several years of drought. The words came, but in written form only, dressed in strength and glory born in those sacred characters that symbolized for me the essence of the divine. They had neither body nor flesh, but were men. They came from the bottom of the throat, from the base of the larynx to be more precise. From the voices of those one seldom hears, beyond the commonness of the everyday, composed of a balance between breath and sculpted air. They possessed nothing more than the appeal of written things and they were no less beautiful for it. I thought this as I listened, and I listened. So, um, now I'll read some newer work, including the uh, uh, beautiful chaplet that Baladana made. And um, so, the earlier poems that I read um, from some beheadings, I was thinking a lot about thinking and also about place and sort of uh, how uh, maybe consciousness or the way we think is shaped by different landscapes and so they end up moving through these different landscapes. Uh, and I found with this essay that uh, it ended up being very, very um, useful for me to write in the wake of some of the poems that I've recently been writing. I've been thinking Again, about thinking, but also about money. So it's money thinking in place. Money being the, the new factor. So, um, so the chaplet is an essay called This Touch, and I'll read uh, the opening of it, and then a poem that sort of uh, relates to uh, some of the stuff I discuss in the essay. This Touch. In some dreams, the emporium is a feature of the landscape rising into relief and toward the open sky. It wasn't built, it grew. Natural is the word one might use unnaturally. The features of the emporium are those of a garden, 
a bit wild. The agoraphile wanders it as in a dream. For in some dreams, the dreamlike condition of the subject is heightened because it has met its deepest desire to walk among the things of the world and to touch them. It is a peculiar sense to touch. Its effects are many. For instance, the subject would like to trade money for the objects displayed to her by the important, and she assumes she has some, but she never quite arrives at the moment of purchase. She is too enthralled somehow. Everything Eubulus said would be here is here. Figs, witnesses to summonses, bunches of grapes, turnips, pears, apples, givers of evidence, roses, meddlers, porridge, honeycombs, chickpeas, lawsuits, allotment machines, irises, lamps, water clocks, laws, indictments, and more, cauliflower, drumsticks, mayfi, marigolds, and jasmine, gourds, many kinds of gourds. Love now is not so corralled, she thinks. And the stalls seem to continue, as out of some need for posterity. Like weeds they infiltrate, seem to create more space, an abstraction building up in the head. She forgets to touch it. Upon waking, the entire thing has slipped away, save the desires of consumption. The subject wishes to find this market again, but the regular stores will have to do. She notices her use of the word market and intends at some point to examine the provocations of such a word and words like emporium and agora. What's more compelling is consumption. She loves to eat and is sensitive to textures in the mouth, but there is also the work of touching the fruit, learning its form and degree of firmness, lifting it to the nose to smell, and from this inferring its taste in the future, one day from now, two days, a minute. So touching is an implement of futurity. You touch your skin this way sometimes, or your mother's. Her mother understands the market differently, which arouses her curiosity. She is a kinder woman and knows the people she haggles with. When Lewis Mumford writes that in its primitive state, the agora was above all a place for palaver, he means first, not backwardly, the agora was a meeting place. In the city she grew up in, the Monday is a meeting place is a euphemism for many costs can be found here. The price of coriander may be haggled, but not your cost. Across from the Monday is a police station and the Karnataka pork shop. This is the subject's first memory of markets. Memory for her is less an affective experience and more a palette for thinking. Some people have a lot of feelings, and the feelings are tied to past events, to people, and to palaver, which has a tinge of trauma. The subject makes a distinction between feelings and sensations. Sensations accrete, become material, and are inseparable from the work of figuring out why everyone has so precise a sense of themselves that the heart's abstractions beat louder than wet rain on dry skin. I can remove myself from feelings, but not from sensations, she is able to articulate. Names are invented for the rhetoric of feelings. It is a great difficulty to describe sensations to follow the sensation into memory or television, the wiry sort of intellectualism that accompanies it. But to be able to describe is to consider that language is not escapist, but a ground to which you return. It reigns you in. It gives form to the sense of alienation, which is a condition of existence. Then that form is repeated everywhere. In the early 20th century, a woman whom the subject knows as F describes the sensation of an object in this fashion. The piece of fabric, I crush it. This results in a distinctive pang in my stomach. Then I experience a sort of intense pleasure that completely halts my breathing. I am as though drunk. I cannot restrain myself any longer. I tremble. Um, so next I'll read a poem called Emporium, which um, is again about a marketplace.
Emporium. As if I could simply pass through the carts, hand myself over to some notions piled on a cart, trade away certain desires amid the sulk and squid, certainty like a quality of gems and cautious doctrines, trade away myself, wouldn't be too unlovely in derivative light, lamps all succulents above the general meat, would it, butchers? For tartan weather or any grid-like complexity of time and back to square home. The sugar makes a mound there as one's bright pyramids, and the smells here are superlative, all brine and depth, as though one upon the other we a forest, and the tapestries descend, and wouldn't we endlessly such velvet landscapes by. As if I could simply stay here with the provocations, and if I did, what would I sell? And would I look at the mongers and hooks? Would I love these men? I would. Love now is not so corralled, and distance dreams itself out of longevity. Bowie strings a violin. A neat bird suggests the literal. The lines settle into excellence. Come on, Eros, arrowy. Why not the important? The chief comparison is to a quality of light. The people have not poured in as light, won't pour out. The poets stall, vending short texts and long texts. Scarves run through bodily fluids. We live in the clusterfuck. The chief definitions are here now. The chief efforts <coughs> are of market spinning, carnival eyes, pastimes replete with blinds. The chief binaries fold and unfold. The garden in the kitchen is in the street. Sweet herbs and cow patties. Sweetness, the provocation and chief style of the poets. The extent to which history inscribes industrial products is perfume, one writes, cupping and silver. Petals, petroleum, idioms, perfuse entangled in the neck, a goblet. History paves the emporium and Horus, the gem light. And says the purveyor, best not study such shapes but silk, to me of silks, of the brushing of blouses against silken nipples, of between her legs the stolen red, and even money isn't quite like money when silk buys me, or have I it, or has it blended in the fabric so, when there was a room for me to try on the, there was weather then, and now, too, it's sulking my mind. And the qualities, as they continue, are the silk under the hand, reads the libel. Silk, that's the dual era and shock of new precision, an involuntary, not involuntary exactly, but desired frisson. I've pulled the brocade off the rack. Accents ascend the sound field. Bonny suns climb the vaulted ceiling. Magnets. My senses, cursive, seek an angle, sensing danger, name an enemy, nylon. Or did I mean history? Did I mean shale? And of what is it collaged? How does it cohere? Sudden queries, sudden as vendors. Do they sell fruit, sell textile? I've been so exact, I've cut corners. O oh, obsolescence, O oh, light brain sifting the accidental tree. I desire cinema in a sense, all factories sense the dilemma. Ought I shove off? The emporium moves by shift of wind, shuffles its constituents, atomizes in concept, not material, yet how suggestive, how like a pleasant sea, that fine spring. Thank you.
Tell him solves the, the displaced voice. The reader imagines a world in which we bifurcate as many times as the languages we speak. A self for English, a self for Arabic, a self that woefully privileges certain words over other words because of their relative ease of pronunciation, the seams and the stitching, the binding that wefts it all, harbors its own intricacy, but maybe too can just as easily unravel. Iman Marsal is an Egyptian poet, essayist, translator, and literary scholar. She is the author of five books of Arabic poetry, selections from which have been translated into several languages, including English, Spanish, French, Italian, German, Hebrew, and Hindi. In English translation, her poems have appeared in Parnassus, Paris Review, The Nation, American Poetry Review, Kenyan Review, Michigan, Michigan Quarterly Review, and elsewhere. A selection of Marsal's poetry entitled, These Are Not Oranges, My Love, and translated by the poet, Haled Matawa, was published in 2008. The most recent publications include an Arabic translation of Charles Simmons' memoir, Fly in the Suit, and a group of essays, How to Mend, A Motherhood and Its Ghosts. She moved to Boston in 1998, and then to Edmonton, Canada, where she is currently an associate professor of Arabic literature at the University of Alberta. So without further ado, let us welcome Iman. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to mention. <laughs> Inserting myself. <laughs> Insert yourself as you were. Um, so Omar is going to be reading the English translation of Iman's work. So Iman is reading in Arabic. Omar will be reading the English translation. So as you were. So, thank you for all of the work for this event. I will start my reading with um, the beginning of the book, the shuffle book. Um, my piece is um, titled um, The Displaced Voice. And uh, <clears throat> just I want to tell you why I am so interested in accent. Obviously, because I have an accent. Uh, so. <laughs> But, uh, but really, before English accent, I, I moved from uh, the north of Egypt to Cairo as a young writer and uh, faced the recognition of having accent. You don't know that you have accent until you go elsewhere or uh, be challenged by others. And then I came to North America, I think I was almost 30, but not knowing um, English, except, you know, for saying hi and, and I'm fine and this stuff. And, and I, I started to uh, work to, uh, toward a, an academic career. And accent was my nightmare at, at the beginning, at least. And I remember usually um, putting my hand on my mouth whenever I'm speaking English, as if I'm trying to hide something. So anyway, I wrote this piece, and it was published 2011. And uh, I forgot about this project as people do usually, but I am back to it actually uh, recently, revisiting the theme of accent uh, through asking different questions, such as uh, if there is a gift in accent. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read the beginning of this um, piece only uh, in, in Arabic, and uh, <coughs> I'm going to read the same part, and then I read three poems um, uh, in Arabic. الصوت في غير مكاني لنفرض أن الصوت هو خيط من الضوء يمتد بين فم المتكلم وأذن من يسمعه بين النية وما تقول إليه من تأويل في في ذهن متلقيها وأن اللكنة ذبذبات ملونة تتواتر حول هذا الخيط ولا تتطابق معه أنها تساعد في تبعيم ضوء الخيط أحيانا كأنه رسالة إضافية لنيته وأنها قد تقطع وتعطل أحيانا أخرى كلمة واحدة تسقط من جملة منظومة في حبل مضيء كافية لأن يتوتر الخيط ويهتز تتسع عين صاحب الأذن وتنشط حاسة البصر لالتقاط الكلمة التي تسقط بفعل اللكنة قبل أن تصل إلى الأرض قد تتسع عين المتكلم أيضا قد تهدر أعضاء كلها بلغاتها لتساعد في توصيل نيته رغم انقطاعاتها إلى الأذن التي تنتظرها أظن أنني أفكر بالصوت الفردي يقول لا كمنتج في زلقي الهبال الصوتية التي يحملها الهواء ولا كهامل لنية اللغة وهذا فيها ولا كنقيد للموت 
بل قطاقة تولدها اللكنة لكي تحمل الصوت الفردي واللغة التي ينطقها والنية التي يقصدها طاقة اللكنة تتبع وقتا إيقاعا آخر يخص اللغة الأم وعندما يحملها الصوت في لغة أجنبية يولد التشوش الذي أتخيله وكأنه محاولة نطق لغتين في نفس اللحظة واحدة ظاهرة والأخرى مختفية واحدة تتحرك والأخرى مركونة وتحارب ضد الإهمال والترك اللكنة ليست أحد أمراض النطق بالضرورة بل هي دفاع اللغة الأم المستميل ضد الفناء منافسة اللغة الأجنبية عبر تخريب العلاقة بين الصوت وإيقاع فيبطر مقطع هنا أو هناك يتسارع حرف غريب حيث كان يجب أن يتباطأ يقف الصوت على رأس صوت آخر ويقدم جزءا من فضائه التخريب قد يأتي أيضا من كرم اللغة الأم في التعامل مع الوقت فتضيف حركاتها لسواكن اللغة الأجنبية فيصبح ستريت أي البرامسيت سين ستريت أور كلوز وات كلوزز إذا تخيلنا أن صاحب اللكنة وهو يتلفظها هو فرد في غير مكانه فلنتخيل معا أن اللكنة هي صوت في غير مكانه قد يتدرب صاحب اللكنة على أن ينتمي لمكانه الجديد قد ينجح في تخبئة لكنته وفي قمعها طويلا ثم تأتي تلك اللحظة التي يكون فيها إسرار ليست مصادفة أن لحظات الغضب هي أكثر اللحظات التي تقب فيها اللكنة بكامل بهائها ربما لأن الغضب أقدر على استنفار الأحبال الصوتية من الرضا أكثر تهييجا للذاكرة واستحضارا للغة الأولى التي تنتقم بممارسة صوتياتها وبإشاعة الفرضة صاحب اللكنة ليس بالضرورة مهاجرا من لغة إلى أخرى بل قد يكون مهاجرا من لكنة إلى أخرى داخل نفس اللغة عم عوض بواب العمارة التي أسكن فيها في القاهرة يتحدث للسكان بأدب جم قاهرية لا غبار عليها تقفز لكنته الصعيدية بمجرد أن يصرخ في أحد أبنائه أو يتعارك مع أحد بواب العمارات المجاورة صوت شخص ما قد يكون أكثر فردية في لغة الأم يتم التعرف عليها بنبرته الشخصية بحبته وتضلعاته إذا أردت الاعتماد على رولان بارد حين يحمل الصوت لغة أخرى تشوش اللكنة على فرديته تشير بدأب إلى الجماعية المختبئة للغته الأولى صوت الإتش في الإنجليزية يصبح أقرب إلى الخاء العربية عندما تتحدث لي ناتالي زميلتي في العمل إنه صوت الروسية وليس ناتالي فقط في سنة الأولى في أمريكا كان صوت حرف ال P يبدو لي مثل حجر قادر على إسقاط أي كلمة تحتويه من خلف الضوء الذي أقف هذا هو الحرف الذي نسميه بالعربية باء ثقيلة حرف ليس من لغتنا ويكفي الفشل في نطق لتخمين أن العربية, العربية هي اللغة المركونة في الداخل عندما تقدمت لوظيفة أستاذ في جامعة ألبرتا كان علي أن أمر بكل ما تستدعيه المنافسة في سوق العمل الأكاديمي من اختبارات تدريس فصل للطلاب أمام لجنة أكاديمية مقابلات منفردة مع الأساتذة والطلاب والعميد ولكن أقصى الاختبارات كان إلقاء محاضرة لمدة 45 دقيقة أمام حشد من الأكاديميين والجمهور الجامعي لم يكن مضمون ما أريد قوله هو ما يرغبني بل كيف يمكنني أن أقوله بنعومة وبدون اصطدام بمطبات الكلمات الطويلة الكلمات ذات السواكن بلا حرقة تفصل بينها الكلمات المفصلية التي يعني سقوطها من التواصل سقوطي في الوصول إلى الوظيفة بدت اللكنة في تلك اللحظة مثل عاهة يجب التقليل من خسائرها البصري واصل ابن عطاء ولد سنة 80 ومات 131 هجرية الفقيه المعتزل الفصيح الذي يشار له بالبنان والذي كان يخطب بلغته الأم كان أعداؤه يتنمرون عليه بسبب لا صغته بسبب صوت واحد لا يستطيع نطقه كما يجب وهو حرف الراء عبقرية ابن عطاء اللغوية ألهمته أن يخبئ عاهته بتفادي الكلمات التي بها هذا الحرف كان عليه أن يستبدل كل بدنو أنوار بألاء يغفر بيعفو فراش بمدجع ومطر بغيس له خطبة كاملة بدون حرف راء واحد هذا ما كان عليه عمل تفادي الأصوات التي قد تبعثرها اللكنة 
فلا تصل لأحد لا أذكر الآن كم من من كلمات تم استبدالها لكي لكن أذكر أن أفكاري كانت تتطور وتنتعش بسبب لعبة الاستبدال بعض الكلمات لم يكن ممكنا استبدالها وأذكر منها كلمة أركتكتشر أركتكتشر هكذا حاولت أن أراها بحروف عربية بجسد لغة أليفة حتى أتذكرها لحظة نطقي بالكلمة في المحاضرة ترجرجت خيل إلي أن مسجدا أمويا بالتحديد ينهار في مكان ما وأن تحطم زجاج شبابيكه يخرج مع صوته translated by Lisa White. Let us suppose that the voice is a thread of light stretching between the mouth of the speaker and the ear of the listener, <coughs> between intention and interpretation, and that an accent is colored oscillations vibrating around this thread, but not congruent with it. At times, these oscillations may intensif intensify the thread's light, adding perhaps to the original intention. At others, they may impede or disrupt it. A single word falling from a sentence threaded on a luminous cord suffices to make the thread strain and shake. The listener's eyes widen, his vision sharpens, hoping to catch the word dislodged by the accent before it hits the ground. The speaker's eyes may open wide as well. All his limbs and organs may rally to the cause, each in its own idiom, helping to convey the intention, gaps notwithstanding, to the ear of the person awaiting it. I am not referring to the individual voice here as a psychological product of vocal cords carried on the airwaves, as a physiological product of vocal cords carried on the airwaves, nor as a vehicle of linguistic intent and its target, nor as a refutation of death, but as an energy born from the accent in order to convey the individual voice, the language that voice utters, and its intention. The accent's energy follows a different tempo proper to the mother tongue, and when the voice carries it into a foreign language, the result is an illusion of an attempt to speak two languages at the same instant, one on the surface and the other concealed, one in motion and the other sidelined, up in arms, at its neglect and abandonment. The accent is thus not necessarily a speech defect, but rather the mother tongue's struggle against mortality. It is competing with the foreign language via sabotage, sabotage of the bond between voice and rhythm. A syllable is amputated here or there. An unfamiliar letter rushes forth when it should have bided its time. A sound leaps onto the head of another and chomps off a part of its allotted space. <coughs> the sabotage may also come from the generosity of the mother tongue in its dealings with time, adding a few split seconds with its vowels where the foreign language permits none. Thus, street becomes... Street. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Then let us together imagine the accent as a displaced voice. This person with an accent may practice long and hard in order to fit into his new place, and he may succeed in hiding his accent or in suppressing it for a long time. But sooner or later, along comes the fatal moment when practice fails him. It is no accident that moments of anger are those where the accent in all its glory is most likely to rear its head. Perhaps this is because anger sticks better to swollen vocal cords than satisfaction does, and is better at agitating the memory and calling forth the first language to exact revenge, applying its phonology and stirring up chaos. 
Someone with an accent need not be an emigrant from one language to another. He may well be internally displaced, an emigrant from one dialect of a language to another. Awad, the doorman of the building in which I live in Cairo, speaks to its residents with unimpeachable decorum and in faultless Kyrene. But his upper Egyptian accent leaps out the moment he yells at one of his children or becomes embroiled in an argument with one of the doormen of the neighboring buildings. A person's voice can be more individual in his mother tongue, recognizable by its particular timbre, its grain, should I quote Olambach. When the voice takes on another language, the accent is muddled in its individuality, tirelessly pointing back to the concealed collective phonology of its mother tongue. For example, the English H is more akin to an Arabic H when my colleague Natalie pronounces it. This is not just Natalie's voice, but the voice of the Russian language asserting itself. In my first year in America, the sound of the letter P seemed capable of dislodging any word that contained it from the thread of light behind which I stood. <laughs> this is the letter that we often refer to as heavy B in Arabic, a letter that doesn't exist in our language. A failure to pronounce it is enough to suggest that the listen, to the listener that Arabic lies dormant inside you. When I applied for a position as a professor at the University of Alberta, I had to jump through all the hoops that the academic marketplace requires, teaching a class in front of an academic committee, individual meetings with professors, students, and the dean. But the severest trial of all was to deliver a 45-minute lecture to a packed academic audience. It wasn't the, content, the content of what I wanted to say that terrified me, but rather how I could deliver it smoothly. How could I manage to do so without colliding with the bumps in the long words, words with their dread or dread consonant clusters, pivotal words whose fall out of sequence would mean my fall from contention for the job? The accent at that moment had to be considered as no less than a speech defect whose repercussions must be minimized. Wasil ibn Ata, uh, 698-749 AD, was an eloquent and provocative Mu'tazili theologian from Basra who preached in Arabic, his mother tongue, and whose enemies bullied him because of his inability to properly pronounce the trilled R. But his linguistic genius inspired him to hide his defect by avoiding words that contained this letter, replacing them with synonyms. Dunu for qurb, proximity. Ala for anwar, lights. Yafu for yaghfir, forgive. Majja for firash, bed. And ghayth for matar, rain. He even crafted an entire sermon without one single R. <laughs> that is what I had to do. Circumvent the, sound. <laughs> Circumvent the sounds, the accent might muddle. I no longer remember how many words I had to substitute. But I do remember my ideas flourishing in this substitution game. Some words, however, could not be replaced. And I remember one, architecture. My solution was to rewrite it in Arabic script, trying to visualize it that way in the shape of a reassuringly familiar language so that I might remember how it sounded. But at the critical moment, I tripped over the word, and a mosque, an Umayyad mosque specifically, seemed to be collapsing somewhere, <laughs> the sound of its broken glass windows issuing on the thread of my voice. Thank you. <laughs>
الكتاب وقع خيط القصة في الأرض فنزلت على ركبتي أبحث عنه كان هناك ذلك الاحتفال الوطني ولم أرى إلا الأحذية المستوردة والبيادات على مقعد في قطار قالت لي أفغانية لم ترى أفغانستان الانتصار ممكن تمنيت يومها لو سألتها هل هذه نبوءة؟ بدت تهتهتي بالفارسية كأنها خارجة من كتاب المبتدئين وهي كأنها تلتقطها من خزانة ملابس قتل صاحبها في الحريق لنفرض أن الشعب وصل عن بقرة أبيه إلى الميدان أن الشعب ليس كلمة قبيحة كما أن لا أحد يعرف ما معنى بقرة أبيه إذا كيف حضرت كل هذه الكلاب البوليسية إلى هنا؟ ومن غطى وجوهها بأقنعة ملونة؟ الأهم من ذلك أين سقط الخيط الذي يفصل بين الأعلام والملابس الداخلية؟ بين الأناشيد والنشيد؟ بين الله وكائناته التي تمشي على الأرض لتدفع الضرائب؟ الاحتفال كأنني لم أنطق هذه الكلمة من قبل، كأنها خرجت لتويها من قاموس إغريقي. حيث رجع أهالي سبارتا منتصرين إلى سبارتا ولم يكف دم الفرسي على التروس والرماح ربما لم يكن هناك قطار ولا نبوءة ولا نبوءة ولا أفغانية جلست أمامي لساعتين أن الله يضلل ذاكرة مخلوقاته من وقت لآخر ليتسلى ولكن المؤكد أنني من موقعي هنا بين الأحذية والبيادات لن أعرف من بالضبط انتصر على من uh, so we'll read three poems. They're from Iman's latest poetry book, which was not published in 1913. Uh, <laughs> 2013. And uh, they were all translated by Robin Creswell. A celebration. The thread of the story fell to the ground, so I went down on my hands and knees to hunt for it. This was at one of those patriotic celebrations, and all I saw were imported shoes and jackboots. Once on the train, an Afghan woman who had never seen Afghanistan said to me, triumph is possible. Is that a prophecy? I wanted to ask. But my Persian was straight from a beginner's textbook, and she looked while listening to me, as though she were picking through a wardrobe whose owner had died in a fire. Let's assume the people arrived en masse at the square. Let's assume the people is not a dirty word, and that we know the meaning of the phrase en masse. Then, how did all these police dogs get here? Who fitted them with party-colored masks? More important, where is the line between flags and lingerie, anthems and anathemas, God and his creations, the ones who pay taxes and walk on earth? Celebration, as if I'd never said the word before, as if it came from a Greek lexicon in which the victorious Spartans march home with Persian blood still wet on their spears and shields. Perhaps there was no train, no prophecy, no Afghan woman sitting across from me for two hours. At times, for his own amusement, God leads our memories astray. What I can say is that from down here, among the shoes and jackboots, I'll never know for certain who triumphed over whom. من النافذة من الممكن أن تميز الشخص الذي تحطم من قبل الشخص الذي بعد أن تحطم نجحه في تثبيت ظهره أو ربط عنقه بالكتفين من وقفتك هذه تشرب القهوة وتتابع العابرين قد تخمن شكل الشريان الذي نقلوه من معصمه إلى قلبه أو تلمح لمعان المسامير التي استوردوها من أجل الركبة سترى بوضوح إخلاصه لخطوته بطيء ربما ويمشي عادة في خط مستقيم لن يلتفت نحوك فترى عينيه إنه مغلق بإحكام الأمر سيكون أسهل مع شخص تبعصر من قبل الشخص الذي تبعصر من قبل عادة ما يتلفت حوله كأنه يبحث عن جزء ما زال ضائعا منه وقد يبدو في التفاتته حلوا جدا لأنهم ألصقوه بالصمت أو مرا بعد الشيء لأنه يبالغ في إضافة الجراء ليسد فجوة بين عدوين 
لا أظن أنك من زجاج النافذة يمكن أن تدرك هؤلاء الذين تمزقوا من قبل لا شيء يميزهم في الحقيقة أقصد ربما كل منهم لا يشبه إلا نفسه مثل ملصقات مختومة تم نزعها من أغلفة المزاريف وانتهت عند هواة جمع التوابع The window You can identify the one who broke apart, the one whose spine they managed to straighten, whose neck they stuck back on his shoulders. From where you stand, drinking coffee and watching the passers-by, you imagine the line of the vein they threaded from his wrist to his heart. You catch the glint of imported surgical pins in his knees. You see how carefully he takes his steps walking slowly, usually in a straight path. He'll never turn for you to see his eyes. This one is sealed tight. It will be easier with one who's scattered. The one who's scattered often turns around, as though looking for a part he's still missing. When he turns around, he sometimes looks sweet, because they've patched him together with gum, or else somewhat bitter, from all the glue stuck between his limbs. I don't think you can make out from the window the ones who are torn to pieces. There's really nothing to distinguish them. Or else, each one looks just like himself, like cancelled stamps unfixed from their envelopes that ended up in some philatelist's album. من سوق الفضة استبدلته بحبر قديم وكراسة أسود حدث ذلك قبل أن أنسى الصفحات على مقعد قطار كان من المفروض أن يرسلني إلى البيت وكان كلما وصلت إلى مدينة بدأ لي أن بيتي في مدينة أخرى تقول أولجا من دون أن أحكي لها ما سبق البيت لا يصبح بيتا إلا لحظة بيته تكتشف احتمالات حديقته وغرفه الواسعة في عيون السمسار تحتفظ بكوابيسك تحت السقف نفسه لنفسك وسيكون عليك أن تخرج بها في حقيبة أو اثنتين على أحسن الفروض أولجا تصمت فجأة ثم تبتسم مثل ملكة تتباسط مع رعاياها بين ماكينة القهوة في مطبخها وشباك يطل على زهور زوج أولجا لم يرى مشهد الملكة وربما لهذا لا يزال يظن أن البيت هو الصديق الوفي عندما يصبح أعمى أركانه تحفظ خطواته وسلماته ستحميه برحمتها من السقوط في العتمة أبحث عن مفتاح يضيع دائما في قار الحقيبة حيث لا تراني أولجا ولا زوجها حيث أتدرب في الحقيقة حتى أتخلى عن فكرة البيوت كل مرة تعود إليه وتراب العالم على أطراف أصابعه تحشر ما استطعت حمله في خزائنه مع ذلك ترفض أن تعرف البيت بأنه مستقبل الكراكي حيث أشياء ميتة كانت قد بدت في لحظة ما تفاوضا مع الأمل ليكن البيت هو المكان الذي لا تلاحظ البتة إضاءة مستيئة جدار تتسع شروخه حتى تظنها يوما بديلا للأبواب The idea of houses I sold my earrings at the gold store to buy a silver ring in the market. I swapped that for old ink and a black notebook. This was before I forgot my pages on the seat of a train that was supposed to take me home. Whenever I arrived in a city, it seemed my home was in a different one. Olga says, without my having told her any of this, your home is never really home until you sell it. Then you discover all the things <laughs> then you discover all the things you could do with the garden and the big rooms, as if seeing it through the eyes of a broker. You've stored your nightmares in the attic, and now you have to pack them in a suitcase, or two at best. Olga goes silent, then smiles suddenly like a queen among her subjects, 
there in the kitchen between her coffee machine and window with a view of flowers. Olga's husband wasn't there to witness this regal episode. Maybe this is why he still thinks the house will be a loyal friend when he goes blind. A house whose foundations will hold him steady and whose stairs out of mercy will protect him from falling in the dark. I'm looking for a key that always gets lost in the bottom of my handbag where neither Olga nor her husband can see me drilling myself in reality so I can give up the idea of houses. Every time you go back home with the dirt of the world under your nails, you stuff everything you were able to carry with you into its closets. But you refuse to define home as the future of junk, a place where dead things were once confused with hope. Let home be that place where you never notice the bad lighting. Let it be a wall whose cracks keep growing until one day you take them for doors.